No? Are you ready, guys? Okay. So, good, boa tarde a todos and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Enrique Folhas and I work for Siena. Siena is a Portuguese NGO focused on a marine conservation that works mainly on sustainable fisheries, marine litter and MPAs. And we are here today to talk about an aspect of environmental work that a lot of us don't know, almost nothing, and I put myself on this. And they are the legal tools available to enforce countries to comply with their obligations to proper management and enforcement on Natura 2000 sites, and more specifically on MPAs. This webinar was held possible with the help with another NGO, Irish RGO, NGO, uh, Irish Wildlife Trust, that is a partner in a project uh, called Making MPS Work in Europe. And for this webinar, we have the pleasure to have two guests, John Condon and Soledad Galega, two lawyers that work for Client Earth, and they will try to enlighten us about this world that is the law. We'll start our webinar with a presentation from John, that is a marine habitat lawyer and is work focused on the laws relating to marine conservation issues, including species protection and the conservation of marine habitats, and addressing the impacts of destructive fishing. We'll be presenting the legal toolkit that Client Earth developed with is at risk and providing an overview with legal tools for challenging the unlawful management of the Natura 2000 sites. This presentation will be followed by Soledad, that is a wildlife and habitat lawyer and works to improve the implementation and enforcement of laws that protect habitats and species, especially in the Mediterranean countries within the EU, including strategic legal interventions to protect wildlife. Our presentation will be focused on how enforce habitats directive in national courts, and she will present a case law on management of plants. Like every webinar, this will not follow the rule. This will be this after these presentations will be followed by a Q and A session, and we ask all the participants to put their questions on the Q and A and not in the chat for us to be more easy to read them to our guests and try and them try to answer them, just not to scatter around on this platform. You can start also putting your questions during the, the presentation since we will read it by the order they are placed. A last reminder for all of you that that's, this webinar will be recorded and then shared with everyone. So that can be seen again after by people that could be present today with us and showed interests. I think I don't have any more information to give, so let's give the floor to the people that matter today. And John, you can start your presentation whenever you you want. Thank you very much, Enrique, and uh, thank you to yourself and uh, Sienna for uh, inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, in this webinar today. Uh, I'm just going to uh, share my screen now, if I can. I hope everyone can see that. Let me know if there are any issues. Okay. So, um, firstly, I just want to briefly say a word about uh, Client Earth, uh, who both Soledad and myself work uh, for. And um, we are an environmental uh, NGO uh, in several offices in Europe, including London, Brussels, where I'm based, uh, Madrid, where Soledad is, and, and several other offices. And our basic uh, focus is on environmental laws and how we can improve environmental laws uh, across Europe. And we do that through uh, legal interventions uh, in, nation, in national member states and also through advocating for more ambitious and more effective environmental laws. Um, but today uh, I want to talk to you about uh, a legal toolkit that a client earth has been developing with um, Seas at Risk, uh, Siena and Irish Wildlife Trust. And it's um, a very exciting document that we will be publishing very shortly. Um, Seas at Risk is working on a dedicated marine, protection, marine protected area uh, website. Uh, 
and the toolkit will be published uh, on that website uh, over the next few weeks. Um, and uh, as part of my talk today, I just want to provide a brief uh, overview of some of the uh, important aspects of this toolkit, and particularly uh, providing an overview of some of the really important conservation laws we have in the EU that apply to uh, MPAs, and also to uh, talk briefly about some of the legal tools that campaigners and NGOs can used to try and affect real, uh, real change to how uh, MPAs are managed. Um, so why this uh, toolkit? Um, one, of the, uh, one of the striking things about um, uh, MPA management in the EU is that we actually, we actually have quite, quite decent uh, conservation laws uh, in the EU and that if they were actually followed by everybody we would have uh, quite good uh, MPAs, um, but the problem is that these laws are not uh, being translated into effective uh, protection on the ground, as I'm sure many of you who are uh, participating in this webinar uh, know all too well. Um, for example, we have uh, only 1.8% of the EU marine area is covered by uh, MPAs with management plans. Uh, WWF have produced a very interesting report about that. And we also see that commercial fishing is, in fact, uh, incredibly more intensive in, in marine protected areas, areas than outside of them. Um, uh, commercial fishing is, has a huge uh, negative impact on MPAs. And for that reason, one of the focal points around our toolkit is to really try and address what can be done to affect the uh, destructive impacts uh, of fishing on MPAs. Um, but we're also, we also discuss other pressures which are highly relevant, uh, such as aquaculture, tourism, pollution, coastal development. Um, when they're not well regulated, they can also have serious adverse uh, effects. Um, and I guess perhaps the main aim of, of this toolkit is to sort of say, we have all of these laws and we're trying to empower uh, campaigners and NGOs to be able to uh, actually make sure that these laws are enforced uh, uh, so that they can actually produce uh, proper results. And we have a lot of good policy being made. We see that the EU biodiversity strategy is talking about 30% of marine protected areas by 2030. But I think in reality, what we'll see is that if we don't have proper enforcement of these laws, we're simply going to be in a situation where, you know, it'll just be 30% of the marine protected area of, of EU waters is, is covered by uh, paper parks, which is obviously uh, not at all what we want. Um, so briefly to discuss what's in the toolkit. Um, the first thing we do is give you a factual overview about how to find out information about uh, the MPAs, uh, how to find out the pressures, what are the protected habitats and species, who is the public authority that's supposed to be regulating these pressures, um, uh, and uh, plenty of other important relevant information. Uh, we also provide uh, an overview of some of the really important laws that apply to uh, marine protected areas. Uh, and the, the really critical law here is the European Habitats Directive, and I will be discussing that uh, later in this presentation. And then we we'll come to uh, the legal tools that can be used to bring about uh, change in how uh, MPAs uh, are managed. And then the final uh, really interesting aspect of this toolkit is we're going to have a number of different case studies which illustrate uh, real world examples of uh, NGOs who have managed to engage in really effective advocacy and uh, uh, use of legal tools to uh, ensure greater marine protection uh, marine protection uh, in Europe. So we have a case study uh, in the UK, we have one uh, on Swedish MPAs, and we also will have a case study uh, on uh, MPAs uh, in Ireland, and a case that has recently been brought to uh, stop uh, fishing in Ireland. Um, one important point to note about uh, our toolkit is that really uh, 
the Tuca would be focusing on uh, marine protected areas that are designated under the EU Natura 2000 uh, network. Um, so they are special areas of conservation under the Habitats Directive and special protection areas under the uh, Birds Directive. It's, these are the MPAs to which European conservation law applies. Um, there are also in many member states uh, national uh, marine protected areas um, but that's a, a, a different uh, set of laws applied to many of those uh, uh, MPAs. Um, and then briefly just to mention that, um, that uh, generally how these, uh, these laws work is they protect specific marine habitats and specific marine species. Um, and I think one criticism of, uh, of that in the marine environment is that there are actually not as many species in protected uh, in the marine environment relative to the uh, terrestrial landscape, which is one unfortunate aspect of the Habitats Directive. And then finally, um, a useful, very useful tool is the Natura 2000 viewer, which I would recommend everybody uh, take a look at whenever you get a chance. It's a very useful tool for finding out about the Natura 2000 sites that are close to you, and you can find uh, for each, each site, uh, it's standard data form, which has lots of really important information about conservation objectives, protected habitats and species, and the threats and pressures for each site. Um, so um, if, I can brief, if I can briefly talk about the Habitats Directive, which is, uh, uh, the main uh, law that uh, has been passed by the EU to protect uh, marine protected areas. And I know it's Sara that will be talking in particular about uh, some of these aspects. So I will try not to uh, get bogged down in too much detail. Um, but um, I think a couple of important points is to, to mention just that all of the measures taken under the Habitats Directive should be designed to maintain or even restore at uh, favorable conservation status habitats and species of community interest. Um, what's interesting here is the fact that um, the directive is purporting to, uh, uh, to restore uh, natural habitats and species when in reality um, we've seen very little of that actually taking place so that would be another area uh, to focus on. And the measures uh, taken under the Habitats Directive uh, can be categorized into two forms. The first are the special areas of protection uh, and the MPAs. And the second is a system of species protection, which isn't of such concern to this webinar. Um, but the, the special areas of conservation have, uh, uh, the Habitats Directive uh, sets up that system and also importantly sets out uh, management obligations that, that member states and their public authorities are required to uh, comply with when, uh, when they're managing their MPAs. Um, two very brief uh, points as well about the Habitats Directive, just to uh, drive home how important uh, a law it is. Uh, the first is that uh, the Habitats Directive is required to be uh, transposed into national law by every member state. So every country, whether it's Portugal, Ireland, France, whoever, will have their own laws uh, which essentially have to give effect to everything that's in the Habitats Directive. And then the final important point to appreciate here is that EU law uh, is, uh, has, enjoys primacy in the European Union. And that means that uh, Every European, every member state national law has to be consistent with the Habitats Directive. So that, um, and this is important because in the toolkit, we give lots of examples of arguments and uh, cases that are derived from uh, the European Courts of Justice uh, and European law. And it's important to be aware that those cases and those arguments have to apply in all of the EU countries. and. Uh, uh, it's not open to national courts to say that they don't have to follow the Habitats Directive. Um, so the, uh, the first of the uh, management obligations is um, the obligation to uh, introduce uh, conservation measures uh, 
in, in the site. Um, this is Article 6.1 of the Habitat Directive. And I know Soledad's uh, speech is talking about how member states have not been very good at this, particularly uh, Spain and Portugal have failed to introduce appropriate conservation measures. And in fact, I've just seen uh, a few weeks ago that the European Commission has uh, referred Ireland to the European Court of Justice because it hasn't uh, established uh, conservation measures in any of its uh, special areas of conservation. Um, so the member states have got a lot of work to do uh, in this regard. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the important things to know about the Article Six One is that management plans, while they're not necessary, um, they should be introduced if need be. Um, I think one of the one of the arguments that we try to make in the toolkit is the fact that um, the only way to really properly uh, protect um, the sites and the habitats and species in in special areas of conservation is to actually introduce management plans is the most effective and uh, most comprehensive way of doing that. Um, and some examples of, of conservation measures as they might apply to uh, fishing, um, just sort of things like prohibiting fishing gear with, with fishing with damaging gears, uh, particularly we're concerned about uh, fishing with bottom uh, trawling gears, which have serious uh, effects on uh, marine and uh, MPAs, particularly sandbank habitats and reefs and um, they have a, a very a negative effect, which uh, member states should be introducing conservation measures uh, to protect. And other measures include limits on fishing efforts and no take zones. Uh, the second uh, obligation is Article 6.2, which requires member states to uh, avoid deterioration of habitats and disturbance, disturbance of species. Um, I think a important aspect of this is to appreciate that um, member states can't just wait until uh, the deterioration has happened. Uh, there's a principle of prevention which says that every country has to actually take appropriate steps uh, before damage has, has actually occurred. They need to prevent the damage arising in the first place. And I think a, a, a logical consequence of this is that member states should be for any activities that are taking place in MPAs that are likely to have any damage, they need to be doing risk uh, and impact assessments um, to uh, make sure that those activities aren't going to uh, cause uh, deterioration. I think we're seeing that uh, a lot of uh, public authorities are not doing these types of assessments. Uh, the final obligation is um, the sort of longer and more complicated and one uh, that has given rise to lots of uh, case law is the obligation to carry out uh, an appropriate assessment uh, of plans or projects and it basically tells uh, public authorities that before they uh, authorize any plan or project um, in an MPA they need to um, carry out this appropriate assessment in order to figure out what sort of impacts the project or plan um, will have uh, on the MPA. Um, I think it's important to note here that uh, the Habitat Directive does not provide for uh, strict MPAs, no take zones, when no activity is provided. Uh, projects or plans can take place. But the critical thing is that they can only take place after this appropriate assessment has been carried out and after it has been shown that um, the project or plan won't uh, uh, affect the integrity of the site, uh, which essentially means to have any adverse effects on the, on, on the marine habitats and species for which the um, site is protected. And a couple of key points here is that there's been case law to say that fishing is a plan or a project for the purposes of this article. Um, we've seen member states try and say that fishing isn't, uh, does not require an appropriate assessment, um, but there's quite clear case law on that. Um, and then I think 
another uh, another comment that I'll just briefly make is that one of the uh, one of the one of, one of one of the additional uh, features of our toolkit will have uh, is site integrity briefings that have been prepared by the Marine Conservation Society, and these would be very important for advising campaigners and NGOs as to what's required to protect the site integrity of the different protected uh, habitats under the Habitats Directive. So that would be another uh, very uh, useful feature of our toolkit. Um, and then just to briefly touch on a few uh, key takeaways um, of uh, the Habitats Directive in Article 6. Uh, the first is that there's a, a very clear requirement to regulate fishing in these marine protected areas, whether it's uh, Article 6.1, Article 6.2, Article 6.3, they all require uh, the member states to do something about fishing and to make sure that fishing isn't having a, a destructive impact. Um, and another important aspect here is that the Habitats Directive uh, operates on the basis of the precautionary principle. And essentially what this boils down to is that the public authorities really need to act uh, whenever there's a possible risk of damage uh, to the NPA. The public authorities need to be doing things like carrying out assessments to understand those impacts. Um, and it's not for campaigners to show damage, it's the authorities uh, who must show that there is actually going to be no damage from these activities. And another corollary is that the authorities must refuse authorization whenever there's a doubt as to whether um, a project or plan uh, could uh, have adverse effects. And then I want to... Um, briefly uh, talk about some of the legal tools that are discussed in this uh, toolkit. And they are information access requests, civic uh, advocacy, national litigation and uh, complaints to the European uh, Commission. Okay, so the first one is the information access request, which is sort of a, a preliminary uh, tool, uh, a very useful tool that doesn't require much uh, work to do. Uh, essentially, it's uh, making a request to the um, public authority for information in relation to the marine protected area, which can be very helpful for obtaining information to help build uh, your advocacy or to help uh, build any uh, legal case that, that you are hoping to bring. Um, and what's quite, information, what's quite interesting in the environmental sphere is that there is a, a specific uh, EU directive uh, uh, called the uh, Environmental Information Directive, which uh, specifically rates, uh, relates to the environment and it entitles uh, members of the public to get access to uh, environmental information requested by uh, public authorities. Um, and that directive has a very wide definition of environmental information. So uh, it's possible to get access to a lot of uh, important information from your public authorities. Uh, information such as things relating to conservation objectives or information about licenses that have been given to fishers or any details of appropriate assessments. Um, so really a, a very useful tool to get information that isn't already uh, in the available on, on the public authorities website. Um, a few, uh, a few uh, tips about making a request. Um, it's quite useful to actually cite the Environmental Information Directive so that um, the authority knows that, you know, this is a formal request and that they have legal, ob legal obligations are triggered under that directive and that they will need to reply to you and they will need to provide you with information unless they have uh, an exemption for doing so. Uh, it's also better to make a, a more targeted request to try and uh, uh, look for uh, information that's more tailored to what you're actually looking for rather than say, you know, asking for every information that the authorities has ever accrued about marine protected areas that will only um, cause consternation and uh, it may be a basis on which you can be refused access. So uh, making targeted requests is, is recommended. Um, the next tool, um, 
which um, I won't spend too long talking about um, because I appreciate that there are probably lots of people uh, from different NGOs and different campaigners who may be uh, on this webinar and they have got great uh, experience and expertise uh, in civic advocacy. Um, the one point that I do want to make is that it can be really useful to uh, use uh, strong legal arguments um, when you're engaged in civic advocacy, uh, especially uh, if, if you don't have any desire to take a court case, um, it could still be important to highlight to the authority that uh, you know, what they're doing is not lawful. Um, no authority uh, wants to break the law and they can often be persuaded by compelling legal arguments that you might be able to make uh, writing letters to the, to the authority or, or in position papers or in responses to uh, public consultations or in um, stakeholder uh, working groups. Uh, so I think the toolkit would be very useful uh, for anybody who's engaged in civic advocacy because it'll provide you with the legal arguments that you can take and then you can use those arguments to uh, engage in really uh, uh, good advocacy with your uh, with different stakeholders and different uh, public authorities uh, who you are trying to persuade. Um, and then the next uh, legal tool that I want to talk about is uh, national uh, litigation or um, uh, bringing, essentially bringing a, a case to court in, in, your, in your home country. Um, uh, one caveat he here is that, um, that bringing a, a case will vary depending on what country you're in. Each country has its own uh, uh, civic procedures and rules for uh, getting access to court and how to bring a case. Um, so I'm really only speaking in very sort of general terms when I talk about uh, in, uh, national litigation and really um, it's one of the reasons why Client Earth. When when we do take uh, uh, cases in in different national courts, we tend to work with uh, local national lawyers because they have all of this expertise about how the national legal system works, and that's a that's a very important aspect of of bringing um, national litigation. Uh, but the essential aim of of bringing a case to court is. Uh, to try and seek a ruling from a court, from a judge, uh, that will have uh, uh, the public authorities' uh, actions essentially declared unlawful. And uh, the real aim is to try and get a, a court order which would require um, the public authority to actually take steps um, to uh, address what it's doing to try and bring it back into compliance with the Habitats Directive and protect the uh, marine protected area. So it's a very powerful tool. If you go to court and you can get an order, um, uh, it can be a huge, a huge benefit. Um, and I'll just briefly talk about, um, uh, just quickly run through the general life cycle of, of, a, of, a, of a court case. Firstly, it might begin with a, uh, in consultation with a, a lawyer. Um, if you choose to retain a local lawyer, you might send a, a letter to the public authority asking them to, uh, uh, to remedy their wrongdoing. Uh, if they don't, then okay, uh, you initiate a claim, you submit a legal claim with legal submissions, setting out your arguments and what's, what the public authority has done wrong and what you want the court to do about it. Uh, and then you might have a court hearing in front of a judge where all of these arguments get, uh, get thrashed out in open court. And this will eventually uh, culminate in a, in a court ruling uh, and a court order, hopefully uh, in, in, in your favor. Um, one thing to quickly mention is that that uh, taking a court case is, you know, it is, it is, a, it is an undertaking that's you know, a decision that's not to necessarily be made lightly. There are risks with, uh, with going to court. Uh, it can be expensive. Um, and just one other concern is that you could set a bad legal precedent. 
by which I mean that uh, a judge might find against you, then you might think your arguments were not good. And that can uh, make it more difficult for other NGOs to, uh, to bring a case uh, to court uh, with that uh, legal precedent uh, uh, having been produced. Um, so there are things to be mindful about before uh, taking the decision to, uh, to go to court. Um, and one other uh, interesting thing that I would like to mention here, and um, particularly in light of uh, uh, a case that was brought by Irish Coast Watch, uh, and it will be in the case study for, the, for our toolkit, but they, um, uh, they have recently obtained a, 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 an interim order um, which can be useful when, uh, when, when the matter is particularly urgent. Uh, it can take a quite a long time for a uh, a court to issue its ruling. So it's, sometimes it's possible to go to court and get a quick order preventing, say, a, a license being granted for fishing in an MPA. And that's what Coastwatch uh, managed to do, um, which is a very, uh, very successful uh, piece of uh, campaigning on behalf of Coast, Coastwatch. So um, I'd recommend uh, reading that case study. And then the, uh, the final legal tool that I'll briefly talk about in the last few minutes is uh, a complaint to the European uh, Commission. Um, uh, the Commission has powers to uh, take uh, infringement action against member states where they do not comply with their habitats directives. Uh, it's under Article 258 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Um, and this is, uh, this is quite important uh, when it comes to marine protected areas, uh, especially for offshore protected areas. Um, because uh, under uh, there's a, a unique uh, procedure for introducing conservation measures for uh, marine protected areas, areas outside the 12 nautical mile zone. Uh, and all of the member states who have fishing interests uh, have to uh, engage uh, in what's called the joint recommendation procedure um, under Article 11, which uh, for any NGOs uh, who've been working in that space, uh, they know that it's a very frustrating procedure and um, tend to produce very bad conservation measures um, for those uh, MPAs. Um, and the difficulty is that, that the Article 11 procedure is very difficult to challenge uh, in a national court. Um, so the only real recourse is to, uh, to try and bring a complaint to the European Commission and to get them uh, to do something about it. Um, and then one final point that I'll make about complaints to the European Commission, uh, usually they will expect that anybody who's made the complaint has done everything they can uh, in their home jurisdiction, whether it be uh, uh, bringing a case uh, to national court first. So that's uh, sometimes a hurdle to bringing a case. Um, they also uh, are, receive a huge amount of legal complaints every year. So they tend to be strategic in what sort of uh, complaints they will take infringement action on foot of. So uh, really there's a need to sort of be strategic in terms of thinking about, uh, is, this, uh, commission's, is, it worth, is this worth the commission's time? So generally, uh, we try to find uh, systemic, uh, systemic uh, breaches of the Habitats Directive. It's far more uh, effective. Um, and yes, that is the end of my presentation. Um, and I think I will hand over now to, um, to Enrique. So John, many thanks for this presentation about this world that is the law that guides us. <laughs> and now I will ask Soledad to, to share us her presentation. Just, John, can you? Yes, I've made Soledad the host now. A moment, I'm just okay. It's all right. Can you hear me well? Wow. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you and participate in this webinar. I'm going to speak about the enforcement of Habitats Directive. 
um, I'm going to speak about conservation measures, management plans, um, litigation, both in the Court of Justice of the European Union and in National Court, with two examples. Um, well, yes. I'm going to start speaking first about Natura 2000 obligations. Uh, John has explained them. It's just a, a to be a framework of uh, where is uh, every obligation set. We have uh, first uh, the more obvious, the designation of protected areas, uh, the SCIs, SPAs, and we have also an obligation uh, to establish uh, within six years a special areas of conservation. As I, uh, since the moment that the Commission approved uh, the list of every country, of every bio, biogeographical region. And second, the second, at the second stage, we have uh, this obligation of adoption of conservation measures and where appropriate management plans uh, is uh, working with other obligations that John explained that prevent deterioration, Article 6.2, the appropriate assessment, Article 6.3 and 6.4. And there are also other obligations that are important. Uh, we have uh, also, when necessary, to establish ecological corridors and connectivity areas that are very important. Moreover, in marine areas, it's not uh, such a clear such a clear obligation as the as the other, but it's there, and other obligation on surveillance, research, monitoring. So, I'm going to speak about the conservation measures, and it's important uh, just to know uh, in which order we we have them. We have have a lot of litigation in many European countries. Um, the first group of litigation was about the designation, clearly. Uh, after we have the, the appropriate assessment and deterioration obligations, and now, now we are in a, in a new, in a last wave of litigation about the conservation measures and management plans, uh, both with the Commission, Court of Justice, and in, in national courts. Um, Article 6.1 of Habitats Directive, as John told, established that special areas of conservation, of conservation uh, in the end, the member states shall establish the necessary conservation measures involving in that the appropriate management plans that are not obligatory and appropriate statutory, administrative, or contractual measures. Where uh, do you have uh, uh, to apply Article 6.1? In a proposed SCA is optional. We don't have a, we don't have to to set conservation measures. In an SCI uh, that is after the six-year period of designation uh, is obligatory. Uh, obviously, in a, a, a special area of conservation. Is obligatory and in, in SPIs under a uh, birth directive, this is uh, this six one is not applicable this article, but we have analogous provisions in the birth directive and it applies to, to the various species of Annex One of the birth directive and migratory species with regular occurrence on the sites. Uh, the form of the necessary conservation measures. It's important to take in account that uh, the statutory administrative or contractual measures are needed in all cases, not all of them, maybe uh, one, one of the three. And man management plans are not always necessary. They are recommendable, but it depends, uh, it's up to every country, to every member state. It's a choice left to them uh, under the principle of subsidiarity. For instance, in Spain, uh, both are obligatory statutory administrative or contractual measures and management plans for all the sites. And in Portugal, we have a, a difference uh, because conservation measures should be adopted uh, through land use planning 
in the Natura 2000 sectoral plan that establish guidelines. Right? And complementary conservation measures can be defined through management plans or this kind of measures. This scheme, this um, order of things, has been recently projected by the Court of Justice of the European Union in a, in a judgment of commissions against Portugal. This is only for the lack of uh, the necessary conservation measures and designation of these areas. What is more important, what is key, independent of the, on the phone, is the, is the content of the necessary conservation measures. Here we have uh, indications uh, that comes from a case law of the Court of Justice, and we have also guidelines uh, from the Commission that is not binding but is interesting because there is a, is a guidance to the interpretation and many things even uh, national courts or even the, the court of justice uh, has uh, confirmed some of this guidance of the, of the commission uh, the, the key points we have a uh, three three main uh, stages so or uh, points first site level conservation objectives it's very important that they have to be set for each site and all species habitats uh, with significant presence in the standard data form of these sites. What does it mean? It means that uh, we need uh, these conservation measures for all the species that uh, are not with the letter D in this standard data form, that is not significant presence. Uh, it's not possible to set them only for a few key features of the sign, for instance, for key species or, or key habitats. Many countries are doing it. Uh, they say, no, uh, we are establishing conservation objectives for these uh, key species or species algo, for instance, in Portuguese, and it's not uh, correct. Uh, the conservation objectives also should define the site conservation conditions of species and habitats targets, deadlines, times, and must be set in function of conservation assessment on the standard data form. It's very important. The Article 6.1 doesn't mention it expressly, but to establish conservation measures, we need first to know what is our objective, what is uh, where we, what we want to get. So it's uh, the, first, uh, the first stage. And secondly, uh, the necessary conservation measures uh, obligatory to establish. There are mechanisms and actions to achieve sites conservation objectives and uh, address pressures and threats of the sites. It's very important. Uh, this information, we have it in the standard data form also. Um, uh, the conservation measures, the management plans should address them in detail. Uh, it's quite obvious, but uh, is, they have uh, not only be adopted, but actually implemented. The Court of Justice has uh, set it in a recent judgment, the Bialovesia Forest Judgment, because the thing is that we are having a list of conservation measures that at the end doesn't have any specific application. Um, well, it's like uh, management plans is like paper plans if they don't are uh, actually implemented. Um, the, and the conservation measures are the necessary ones. They have to be applied within individual sites, of course, but maybe also outside boundaries or maybe across multiple sites. This is important. For instance, uh, for wide regulation of fisheries activities, can go outside of the boundaries, and also for ecological corridors, connectivity between areas, maybe they are not within the protected area, but are important for the connection or for uh, applied measures. Uh, if it's necessary, uh, they should apply the conservation measures outside the sites also. And they have uh, to have sufficient level of detail, who does what, when and how, and the economic resources uh, to apply them. Uh, the, third, uh, the third point is that they have to be set uh, the ecological requirements of habitats and species. 
all ecological needs to ensure conservation of species and habitats, and they must define on a case by case basis. Maybe they are they might be uh, different from one side to other, or maybe from one country to other, or uh, even in the same spaces, and it has to be based on scientific uh, knowledge. Uh, repeat, I repeat, regardless of the form. Uh, we can have management plans, of course, that can be specifically designed for the sites, or also they can be incorporated in other development plans, and in other protected areas plans. But it's very important that they have the conservation objectives and measures for the site area according to uh, Natura 2000 provisions. And even many things, they overlap with other areas, with other protected areas, but not totally. And sometimes we have the, the conservation measures in uh, management plans or development plans of other areas. And are not covering all the area of the Natura 2000 site or all the species of habitat. Um, it's important. Uh, we have also a judgment of the Court of Justice on this sense. And they should address all the known activities in the site, agriculture, hunting, tourism, fisheries. The new projects, the new activities should address under Article 63 of the Habitats Directive, the appropriate assessment, but all the known activities uh, should be included here. And um, also we can have the statutory measures that are usually part of law, in law activities that can be allowed, restricted or forbidden. Administrative measures that can be related to implementation of measures or authorization of activities or uh, areas inside of the, of the site. And contractual measures uh, used to be agreements among managing authorities and landowners or users inside of the protected area. What is important is that uh, regardless of the form, um, even if we use, they use statutory measures, management plans, um, in, in principle, the appropriate assessment of Article 63 is not necessary because it's related to the management of the, of the Natura 2000 site, except, and it's very important because it has been a uh, cause of conflict in some management plans and measures. Uh, activities not meant to meet conservation objectives, uh, for instance, allow use, uh, hunting maybe, or even if they are uh, directed to conservation objectives, measures uh, which might come into conflict with other measures or alter or degrade uh, habitat of species. They are addressed to one kind of habitat, but they can deteriorate uh, other, for instance. Uh, they should be uh, subject to an appropriate assessment. Uh, what kind of litigation we had? Uh, we are having litigation mainly on the grounds that they limit uses or rights of individuals or private companies. And also on the NGO, environmental NGO site, that the conservation objectives and measures are not appropriate or specific to maintain or restore the favorable conservation status of all the habitats and species. And uh, firstly, we're going to briefly look at one judgment of the Court of Justice uh, in a case uh, related to, to Portugal. It was a commission uh, referred uh, Portugal, the Republic of Portugal, uh, to the Court of Justice uh, for the failure to designate uh, the SCIs as uh, sex within six years and establish the necessary conservation measures. Uh, the Republic, uh, the government of Portugal, uh, said state that they have a sectoral plan of Natura 2000 that is legally binding, contains site sheets in the identifying priority key uh, spaces and habitats for each site that sets out management guidelines that it meets the, uh, the requirements of article 6.1 um, the government says that the obligation to establish conservation objectives per site is mm, does not find support in the directive in article 6.1 
and appears only in guidance adopted by the Commission. Uh, to this, the Court of Justice, you know, well, in brief said, uh, state that the general nature and orientations of these measures, because Portugal was saying, well, we have the sectoral plan of Natura 2000, we have the measures also into sectoral plans for hunting, tourism, energy, uh, polar uh, life projects. Um, the Court of Justice said that is, uh, it was too general. And in many respects, uh, the sectoral plans on Natura 2000 are great concrete measures for the effective implementation. And in addition that these measures were lacking because they don't systematically include conservation measures established uh, according to the ecological requirements of each species and each type of habitat present in each of the sites concerned. And so uh, declared that um, Portugal was in breach of Article 6.1 for this reason. After this, uh, I think that, uh, well, Portugal is uh, having public consultation of uh, many management plans and now is adopting this, this form. But, well, it's interesting because we have also this uh, question about the SPAs, what happened with them, because they are just uh, approving or uh, just on the public consultation, they have the plans from the special conservation areas. We have also one second judgment about the content of Natura 2000 management plans. This uh, judgment is uh, from Spain. It's uh, two, two months ago this summer from the Supreme Court. It's, uh, it's not in fact a true management plan. It's uh, an expression of the Supreme Court. It uh, confirms a, a previous judgment of the High Court of Justice of Extremadura. Uh, this fair judgment annulled uh, two years ago one decree of the regional government of Extremadura uh, approving uh, 75 Natura 2000 management plans. The, the court states that a random but significant study of the management plans shows that they are not in fact a management plan, but a sample still photo of the quantitative data available at the time of the preparation. Without knowing the trend, and the evolution of the conservation status that for the court is really important and says that the expression on no trend is overwhelming in the management plans. Uh, also states uh, following the, the case law of the court of justice that is not enough to establish list with conservation measures just to name them in the management plans but there must be mechanisms to ensure their effective implementation. This is Extremadura in the border with Portugal. Uh, we have to take in account that it has uh, 30, uh, it's a, have a lot of area of this region uh, is protected as a Natura 2000. So it was a very important judgment with a lot of management plans involved. 30%. Uh, what uh, were the management plan shortcomings according to this judgment? Uh, it's a very, very detailed uh, corolling. Uh, the court said uh, that no predetermined reference value for each species or habitat was established. They need a specific numbers of specimens, reference population for the good conservation status of the species. If we don't have this, we don't know uh, what direction we, or what measures we should adopt. Uh, they have to define in sufficient detail each of the conservation measures, the who does what, when, and how. Um, each measure must have indicators to evaluate its development, um, mechanisms for the effective implementation, set operational and practical objectives that can be achieved during the period of validity of the management plan, and in conclusion says that none of the management plans uh, take into account the, um, the favorable conservation status that is key. It uh, also uh, made an special pronouncement about habitats, habitats and species linked to water, uh, to fresh water, 
but uh, also would be related to other could be related to other species in, specifically uh, to define the minimum and maximum flow seasonal regimens and necessary generating generating flow for these aquatic species and it's an interesting question because we have a lot, uh, many rivers uh, with uh, five uh, river basin uh, shared between Spain and Portugal. We have uh, this uh, system in Spain that uh, is a, a very tricky competence issue, uh, very conflictive uh, related to environmental flow because they affect a lot of use agricultural use and hydropower use and so basically the conservation measures are established under habitat directive by the regions and the river basin management plans have to establish measures under the water framework directive and they have to be coordinated but in case of conflict we have uh, also the the constitutional code of spain saying who is prevalent well, is going to be a quite uh, an interesting question to set this. <coughs> Excuse me. According to the core, where is the real management plan here? Uh, the core find it in the monitoring plan, deferred over time, said, okay, you say you are going to do this after approve the management plans. And I think that is the thing you had to do first. Analysis of the evolution of the habitats and species to know the trends. Uh, and after this diagnostic set objectives and conservation measures and for the Natura 2000 habitats and species most certainly a specific uh, conservation measures. It's quite simple but you have to do it before to approve the management plan. It's happening also in many projects and programs because uh, they are not carrying out uh, an appropriate assessment and say that they're going to do it after. Excuse me. It says your experience for all Natura 2000 sites in Spain. Uh, and the regional government of Extremadura with that in its appeal to the Supreme Court that this favorable conservation status is referred not to habitats and species in the site, but to the site as a whole. And the Supreme Court says clearly no. The objectives of conservation and the appropriate measures had to be set for the habitats and species for each in these sites and confirm the well the, the announcements of the essential part of 75 management plans and the interesting thing about this judgment is that it's applicable not only in Extremadura but in in all Spain thank you thank you Soledad for sharing with us and now we'll open the Q&A session. Just wait for people to assimilate a little bit all of this information that was shared with us. Meanwhile, uh, uh, Soledad, can you put me as again as a host? Uh, thank you. So I'll once again ask people to put your questions in, in the Q&A and to put the ball rolling, I will ask the both uh, two questions. First, if you have a notion about the colleagues of yours working in Portugal and Ireland mainly, because these are the countries that were here today represented and that they have notion about these laws and about this uh, obligation to their countries with the European Union and how, how inform is the judicial system about these issues, if you have a notion. Uh, because I, I know so that, that you work with other colleagues in other NGOs here in Portugal and other cases. And I don't know if John has experience with Irish uh, lawyers. And another one that it's due to my background as a marine researcher, that always when I'm looking to these documents and seeing the mainly the assessment part is uh, Due to that, that focus that rely on scientific data. How can assessment be properly done when we have, for example, countries that like Portugal have 
assessments in some impacts or in some even the states of their habitats and species outdated i would say with more than 10 years based on more than 10 15 years of scientific data how this can be uh, accounted so i would say you have any insights john soledad take the floor uh, thanks, uh, Enrique. Um, the question about, yes, the, the knowledge of the Habitats Directive uh, uh, in, in Ireland is, is very interesting. Um, I think the, the public authorities uh, are, are, def are aware of the Habitats Directive because they can't not be uh, aware of it. Um, and certainly, uh, particularly with um, uh, Natura 2000 sites that are on terrestrial sites, there has been quite a bit of um, case law uh, generated by people taking complaints in Ireland. Um, I think what is a real gap is is on how uh, how the Habitats Directive is enforced in relation to marine protected areas. And I think that's where um, there could be scope to improve enforcement of the Habitats Directive because we see so many um, we see so many impacts in Ireland, particularly from fishing, and um, uh, um, that's not uh, it doesn't get the same uh, level of uh, uh, respect almost as 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 terrestrial sites do. And as to the judges, um, yeah, I think it very much depends on on what on what judge you get. It's 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 quite a matter of luck. Uh, judges in Ireland tend to be uh, quite general in in their knowledge, so they they deal with a wide variety of cases. Uh, some of them will have familiarity with the Habitats Directive and also familiarity with uh, EU law, um, which is good if you can get that. But other time, other times, um, uh, yes, you can be unfortunate and get a judge who just isn't fully aware of all of the intricacies of of how the Habitats Directive. Uh, works in Ireland, and that can be, that can certainly be uh, a challenge. Sorry, that do you have any comment to or add on? No. So I will pass to. No, I not any any comment more. Yes, uh, one question about administrative measures or contractual measures. Sorry, because I had some problems with my voice today. Um, for instance, in contractual measures, we will, uh, should have um, agri-environmental or forestry environmental uh, measures or contrast with uh, uh, for a specific um, lands that are uh, contract sets with a specific persons. Um, for instance, uh, if you have a a piece of land where is, there is one specific habitat, maybe that is uh, bigger, this kind of measures, but always have to be uh, taken into account the requirements, the ecological requirements of the site. Um, I think that it's preferable they have inside management plans for a transparency, um, public consultation. Uh, I think that it's better to have management plans and maybe if necessary to have this kind of contrast. Administrative measures, maybe for instance, uh, regarding some activities, uh, general provisions. Sometimes you have uh, allowed use in determined areas, sonification, but uh, the plans or conservation measures have to be always very careful because Many of these activities are not uh, direct uh, to the conservation of the beast. So it should be assessed, for instance, even if they are in a general way, uh, you, can say, you can say these activities are not going to need an assessment in this area because many times you, you, we have area one, two, or three, and depending on the area, some activities are low or no. And you can set with these administrative uh, measures uh, in the areas and activities at all. 
but you have to be very careful with this, with the, with the appropriate assessment always. Uh, the delay, I, I don't know if John wants to, to answer it. Is there any benefit to delay the formal designation? Or what other reasons could Ireland have for delaying this step? Well, I, <laughs> I think it's not only Ireland or the countries. <laughs> the reasons, well, it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult because they don't have all the information. Uh, also because uh, they foresee conflicts with uh, uses uh, in, the, in the sites, with activities, with current activities because the management plans have to take in account also socioeconomic uses. And now uh, you are in the last stage and you have to set the conservation measures and you need the money and you need, and sometimes uh, in, in some areas maybe it's easier because they don't have conflicts with uh, previous use, but in others not. In many countries, the problem is that after, for instance, in Spain, after many years of delay, we have hundreds of management plans under public consultation, and it's impossible, really, uh, to have a real participation because you can check uh, in the deadlines, in the public participation, everything. But well, it, I think it's happening in, in many countries. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't say in my opinion that there's one reason, maybe there are. Uh, just uh, many reasons for this. Um, yeah, just to uh, uh, to complement that point, um, <laughs> there isn't any uh, very real reason why a country should not designate uh, uh, their SAC within within the time limit. Um, you know, they are in breach of the Habitats Directive if they don't do it within six years, and technically the obligations do apply and. Um, uh, the country will just leave itself open to uh, the European Commission taking uh, infringement proceedings against that country, which um, which the European Commission has recently done against Ireland. Um, uh, yes, so uh, I mean, it's it's not really acceptable that that sites aren't designated within the required time period. So thank you, thank you. This was two questions. Uh, Put it by Regina. Thank you for um, for Thank that. You. And can you answer the the question that Karen put it? Did you did you have a question, Enrique, earlier about uh, doing the assessments and yes, yes. Problems? We'll go back for the uh, solid start to reply answer the, the that one. So, but if you want, you can go for that because uh, I'm interested in knowing that. Uh, yes, maybe just before we uh, get to Karen's question, I'll briefly talk about that. Um, yes, I mean, the the obligations for the appropriate assessment are, 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 fairly, are fairly clear in terms of, you know, it needs to make sure that there's not going to be any impact on, uh, you know, it needs to assess what the, what the project or plan is going to do in terms of uh, the integrity of the site. And the assessment is fundamentally not complete if they don't have the latest information about the species and habitats that are present on the site. And, you know, there are ECJ rulings that say that, you know, there needs to be a catalogue of all of the species and habitats on the site. So if the assessment is relying on, on very dated information, which is, you know, going to mean that the assessment is not accurate, then fundamentally it's not. It's not an appropriate assessment within the requirements of the of Article Six Three. But uh, in terms, if for example, that it can be a valid uh, uh, to uh, in a court as an argument, as justification, for um, or, I think because yeah. I don't know if a, a lawyer have that a judge have that notion uh, how much time as an assessment will be valid if they say that in. Because their habitats and systems that are so mm -hmm. variable and can be changed a lot in different in so much uh, few time, uh, how can it then be done and proved as a, a valid point? Yeah, well, I think I mean you have to pick some moment in time from which you're making the assessment. But I think if you were trying to you know, look to the court or how, the, how that would work in court. I think if, 
if the assessment was based on just completely data information uh, subject to uh, you know what you could ask the court uh, it would depend on, on what you can do in certain countries but you'd probably be asking for the court to order that the uh, assessment be done again okay uh, with up to date information so you can actually understand what sort of effects are going to happen uh, on the site thank you can you go and answer the Karen's two questions already? Do you want to start? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a question from Karen. Usually that's, yeah. About, about the, the need for site level management plan conservation measures for all species in the standard data form set D. Is, well, um, we have to use always <laughs> the standard data form and the complementary information of the commission on how to, um, to interpret it is an official document it's extremely useful for any case even uh, to check uh, what is happening with the, with the management plans so we have uh, just uh, the species that have to be at the site assessment we have in the population um, uh, parts A, B, C, D, depending on the population of the species on the site. When we have D, is that it's not significant presence. And so uh, we need uh, the conservation of these are measures uh, for the other species, but is there have not significant presence in the site, uh, they should uh, not need these conservation measures is the, the only exception, but it's a special because ma uh, many times we have only conservation of genetics or measures for five, six key species, because there are a lot. Sometimes, uh, well, it's possible to set priorities, of course, for the more threatened species, more endangered and priority, but uh, in many management plans or conservation measures, we have and uh, whole groups of species, for instance, the uh, freshwater species, uh, forgotten many times. Or more, I say, what's happening with this species, with this habitat? It's not in the site. Yes, it's in the site. It needs the conservation objectives, uh, the measures, uh, the adequate measures. But sometimes they say, well, if we set conservation objectives and measures for this species, it's going to cover also this one. Sometimes it can be okay. But in any case, you have to explain it, and it has to be true, of course, <laughs> and it has to be demonstrated, because uh, it's a lot. I know, I know, with a lot of management plans, with <laughs> maybe, but it's the way to do it, and it's the well, lawful uh, way to do it. So, uh, in any project management plan, I always take the standards at the form and check, uh, look for the this mark them. <laughs> And the other ones are the species uh, that we should need to take in account always. Um, I don't know if I answer you. Uh, what do you do? What do you do if they say we have no information on any species like seal lamprey for which a site was it? that uh, they have to to get the information because the site was designated for this species. Sometimes we have to be very careful because say, well, the more important species or habitat in this site is it one or this one. Maybe it's, it's true for the level of the population and the status of conservation. But when every country send the standard data forms and information to the European Commission and the European Commission uh, makes the list, taking account the overall sites, and maybe if in this site, this species or this habitat that has significant presence but is not an A, have a other level of presence, you have to take it in account because uh, we have an overall vision uh, of the conservation in the biogeographical region, not only in this site, on even not only in the country. So it's important. And of course, the information has to be uh, uh, achieved. Thank you. And We'll go to the last one, and just not you to force any more your voice, Soledad. And uh, we'll close after you, you answering. And I will ask you also after answering 
for you both just to give a, a wrap up of and to what we share today here. So the question is related. To, can you see to them? It's I think you can both ask them. Yeah, we have several uh, cases where we see muscle banks, ski habitats, but they may not be mentioned in the data form. Does that mean they can just fit rates? The, well, um, the information in the standard data forms uh, many times is uh, is all one. The, it was rather many years ago. Um, when you draft the management plans and the conservation measures, it's an opportunity to add type to what they did. If you have this species, maybe you have to add to the standard data form and to the site. And as an species that is in annex, in the corresponding annex of the habitat directive and should be inside of the standard data form. Uh, the thing is that legally is not there, there would be not uh, this obligation, but uh, you have to, to have the last information and you have the obligation. If you find this species in sites, just to complete the, the designation and to add maybe these species or new habitats to the standard data form and to the management plans and, and everything needed. It's my opinion. Yeah, and I think um, probably another important aspect is to whether the particular mussel species is, is protected uh, in the, one of the annexes to the habitats directive. If it's not, um, maybe more difficult uh, to stop the dredging. Um, I think one, one alternative would be to sort of look at, um, look at the effects that, um, you know, that, that that muscle is contributing to the, to the ecosystem and to what extent uh, it's important for the, uh, for the actual habitats and species that are already protected under that site. If you can argue that the mussel dredging would actually result in uh, you know, would, uh, would seriously compromise the site because of the effects that the mustard dredging would have on the actual protected habitats and species, then that could be an argument for, uh, for getting uh, the mussel dredging uh, prohibited in, in the site. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to wrap up, I will use the last question that Anna put it here, that I think it's a, a good question to, to wrap up this webinar. And uh, I would like to, for your comments for you both. And she says that in your point of view and experience and regarding the non-existent of effective, effective application of management and conservation measures to protected areas, what is the best and effective way to push the application of these measures in the ground? Lawsuits, communication campaigns for general public, any NGO coalitions, or talk directly with public authorities? Well, in my opinion, in my opinion, all of them. <laughs> you can, for instance, this, this last case uh, from Spain, uh, it was uh, the, the, the environmental NGO that filled the last week, uh, did it in other regions, but with other regions, there was uh, the possibility to, to speak, just uh, to make amendments, to improve the plans. Um, so last week can be effective and also now in Spain all the regions are uh, checking this judgment because uh, they have to, um, to amend some management plans and to do it in accordance. Also the communication campaigns for general public are very very important to understand uh, what Natura 2000 uh, is, uh, obligations, also advantage NGOs coalitions, of course, talk, talk directly with public authorities. Yes, if you have the information, you can help. Many times they, they are overwhelmed by the, I don't know, in, the, in your country, but in Spain, sometimes there are not a lot of people working at technical level on this. And so I think that all the information, all the ideas, all the, um, in my experience, is a combination. A combination of just all the things you, you have said, Anna. Thank you. John? 
Uh, yes, I would sort of tend to agree that there's maybe no silver bullet uh, to getting MPAs protected. Um, but yeah, I think I think sort of advocacy and campaigning is important. Uh, I think it's important as well to try and you know get the narrative correct about marine protected areas. There's sometimes people think, oh, it's you know a reason to you know kick out fishers from 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 MPAs when in fact you know you know there are huge economic benefits to having well protected MPAs in terms of acting as nursery grounds and really helping uh, with the recovery of fish stocks which can actually be um, a huge boost to um, uh, you know low impact sustainable fishing so you know there's not necessarily a contradiction there um, I think that's sort of a, a possibly an important uh, Point to uh, to emphasise. I think as well that you know, if you can get the right uh, court case, if you can get the right you know, uh, uh, legal ruling or legal judgment, that can be incredibly effective in terms of having a sort of a systemic change to how uh, a systemic change to the governance structures of MPAs. You know, there may be one national law or one national policy that. Uh, that all of the public authorities are, are following and, and using to justify their actions. And, you know, that policy might be having, uh, you know, permitting all sorts of activities within an MPA. So if you can get that policy declared unlawful, or you can get that law declared unlawful, uh, that can have uh, really big impacts. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's my two cents. Okay, so we'll wrap up. Thank you to the both. Thank you to all the attendees. And so that I hope you get better soon, as rapidly as, as you can. And thank you once again, even for this, to be able to be with us today and make this effort. And John, we'll keep on touch. And to all of you, many thanks to spend the time with us and hope it was beneficial and for everyone and the time well spent. So have a nice day. Thank you very much for organizing. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.